thank you very much, Rebecca, for um, coming on to to uh, have a wee chat and answer a few questions that we've been thinking up. Um, how are you doing? I'm grand. I'm grand. Just like keeping on, keeping on, trying to stay sane. How are you? <laughs> uh, likewise, yeah. Just uh, trying to stay uh, sane and solvent all at the same time, um, yeah. as as best we can. Um, so we've got a couple of questions that we, we sent through just to, to, to go through and then just anything that comes to mind that you want to chat about or you know, uh, shoot the breeze about, please, you know, please feel free. Um, uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice to, to find out some more of the, uh, uh, the inside goss from, uh, from, your, from your side of things. Um, but uh, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you anything weird. Okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, what's your favourite cheese? <laughs> um, I do have a favourite cheese. It's um, Young Buck. <laughs> I've never heard of Young Buck. It's the one that's made in Yutnards. Oh. Mike's Fancy Cheese in town sells it. Okay, I'll have to get that. Young Buck. Is, okay, is there a store that we can still look, get to that actually sells it? He's open. I think he's still open. Or like on just hours. And he does home deliveries as well. Ooh. Maybe. I'm not getting sponsored by him, don't worry. <laughs> no sponsorships just yet. Um, so was, was there, were there any kind of things that were postponed that you were really looking forward to? Um, plays that are either at the Lyric or uh, down south or in the Abbey or anywhere around the country that you were really kind of looking forward to? Yeah, all of them. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was, it was actually kind of really... Um, well, aside from, like, you know, our shows, I was really looking forward to 1984, that... Um, went into rehearsal basically the week of the lockdown the week we were told to shut so that was a really really difficult decision because we were just you know uh, through the door starting to rehearse that and such an amazing cast such an amazing kind of creative team really really interested about the vision um that kind of lisa had for that project in terms of like you know a show to be so relevant and urgent it just felt like uh, like a, a show that could be you could really speak to now so I'm glad that's sort of being postponed um, and I, I'm in Dublin quite a bit so I'd actually booked into um, a load of shows in Project This Is Pop Baby had like a festival on like a two three week festival so which included like Works in Progress and um, Malaprop's new show so I was actually booked in to see shows the weekend we shut down and then the following weekend and then I was due down to see Patchwork and Bewley's the following Tuesday so I had like a whole like series of trips planned and they were all just they all just went as soon as the the south went into lockdown on the 12th um uh, I mean like that's all up in the air in terms of whether they're going to come back or not but I really really hope that they do mm. um and I was also really looking forward to Macca's um body politics in the Mac um I think that was one one of the first decisions that was actually made by a northern company to kind of to put off that show um so yeah there's been there's just loads of stuff loads of stuff i booked into and really looking forward to um stuff at the gate um kind of nancy harris's play i was kind of booked in to see and um yeah so a lot of work a lot of really really interesting work that i was really looking forward to is sort of gone and you don't know whether it's going to come back or not it's all a bit precarious at the moment yeah I hope it does. Yeah, I mean, one of the lovely things that I've, uh, I've got, you know, that I assume is part of the job, but it's also, you know, it's always great to see you at different events. You know, what's the kind of, what, what's one of the best things about, you know, being the literary manager of the Lyric? What, what's one of your favourite things? But is it getting out there just to see uh, an absolute ton of stuff? Or is it, you know, what, what is it that's uh, absolutely your favourite at the moment? Um, it's like a bit of everything, to be honest. It's like, I really, really love seeing, well, like, like I love theatre, so I love kind of going to see um, theatre and especially new shows and um, I'm always really really interested to see what people are um, you know interested in writing about kind of now um, and also but reading scripts as well um, it, I suppose the thing I enjoy the most is actually meeting artists and trying to support them in any way you can you can like to be a facilitator really and to kind of give them you know whatever tools or whatever kind of resources or advice they need to kind of to kind of uh you know develop the work and to kind of get ideally get the work on um so it's, it's actually everything to do, you know to do with it and i would try to get out to see you know as much theater as i can i mean certainly in you know in northern ireland but i would like i say would be in the south quite a bit and we go to dublin maybe you know at least once a month if not mm. more you know london as often as i can um, obviously, kind of, you know, Edinburgh, Edinburgh Fringe is like a highlight of the year. Like, 
you know, ironically where you see most Irish work is at the Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a bit of everything, I suppose. I really, really enjoy um, that support role, I suppose, kind of being that facilitator. Yeah, well, what kind of brought you to the, the role of, man, uh, of um, literary manager in the lyric? You know, what, what kind of, what was the attraction to it? Is it just, you know, getting to be on the pulse with new writers and uh, uh, and uh, and others, as, you, as you've been saying? But what, what was kind of first attracted you to it? Um, well, I suppose it was like a circuitous route that kind of brought me to the role. So um, I actually worked um, in Bookfinders, um, this kind of amazing secondhand bookshop, a bit of like an institution in Belfast the longest serving member of staff or the longest surviving member of staff there um so we would run like poetry nights and prose nights and like do kind of book you know help you know mary denver the owner kind of do kind of various events there um and then i worked at ni screen for a couple of years and um kind of worked in funding but also did um script development so that's where i really kind of got the the bug for it really like i kind of, I, I i really really loved working with writers I, I love reading their work and you know again facilitating you're not you know facilitating the development of their work and asking I suppose like learning to write uh, sorry learning to ask the right questions I suppose to kind of help them kind of get there um and then I worked for Craft and Life for, for a couple of years kind of which is kind of artist support and development so in terms of the lyric I mean I was in the youth lyric whenever I was a teenager so um it always had this really a kind of magical space in my conscious. It, it's, I remember really vividly going to see kind of my first shows at the Lyric. Um, one of the things I remember most was I went to see whenever I was really, really young, like it must have been like definitely young primary school. And I went to see the Christmas show. And as we were kind of leaving, kind of waiting for a bus, like hanging around afterwards, I remember seeing kind of one of the young actors who'd been in, who like was a star of the show, come out in his, in his school uniform, obviously to kind of go to you know, go to class, go to the rest of his class for the day. And my little mind like being blown by that, that you could be like, there was someone that was kind of my age or a little bit older that was able to kind of live in this kind of amazing kind of magical world. So in terms of like the lyric specifically, it had like a really, really strong place in my, in my heart, I suppose. Mm. Um, so yeah, just to continue, I think, I, I mean, I really love working with writers. So I suppose that was the, that was the main attraction and to see who was, out there and what they were writing about one of the kind of the big things whenever i started was engaging with i suppose that next generation of of northern irish writers um to see who was to, who was out there because they, the theater kind of hadn't really had like an open call for a while so that was kind of the you know the, one of the main priorities was to be kind of being to go out to see work to ask for scripts mm. um to really engage with you know that that wealth of talent that's in the region. Yeah, I mean, the Lyric, um, I think everyone can remember the old Lyric building, who, who's of our generation, uh, and how, you know, that kind of 1970s building had such a uh, such a, a lovely feel going into it. I mean, it's even nicer now with the, the, the new Lyric's kind of building is so light and airy going into it, but there's certainly some lovely nostalgia about the feeling going into the, the old Lyric up those couple of steps into this kind of what well, is in my memory now a big brown um, monstrosity uh, with a lovely set of open stairs. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it, it's such a defining thing, I think, for lots of us uh, growing up in Belfast and Northern Ireland, going to the Lyric and getting to see shows from, you know, uh, everything from Brian Friel to, uh, to uh, WB Yeats. I think uh, uh, some of my weirdest memories and for early memories are, are getting to perform amateur WB Yeats on the, on the Lyric stage. Um, back in when I used to actually perform things, and it does. It does. Uh, it was such a lovely building, but the lyric now is just. It's just you know levels above, and it, it feels so lovely to go into it. It's nice to feel that you know that that is a place for writers to be welcome to now, uh, as much as I suppose it always was. But that you're you're deliberately doing that much much more now. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of that's postponed and kind of uh, you know trailing trailing off for a little bit. Uh, you know, what do you think? What would be good for writers to know in this kind of period of uh, of kind of lockdown? You know, you mentioned the kind of the questions that you'd like to ask. What, what what do you think the the best kind of questions people should be asking themselves at the moment um, because they can't get access to anyone? You know, or you know, what what, what kind of things should uh, young writers and uh, and uh, not so young writers be doing at the moment? Um, that's really interesting. I think the 
I mean, the, the, the first thing to say is if you don't want to or feel like writing, that's absolutely okay. Um, we do, um, we have, we have a, a new playwrights program and as part of it, we have like uh, master classes with kind of visiting dramaturgs and writers and directors. Um, and kind of one of my favorite things about that is that I really, really love it when people come on and they kind of contradict the last person because it shows that there's no right way to do it. It's whatever way you find you can write is, is the way you write. I think, you know, so much of writing is tricking yourself into writing. It feels like so, you, you should be hosting yeah. like a dramaturgy fight night um, <laughs> between different kind of yeah. dramaturgs. It's like, yeah, like, like, you know, like sudden death. <laughs> yeah, but, all the audience like, votes on the best tool to use on your, on your script development. Yeah, well, but then, there, there's no best tool because it, it depends on your personality it depends how you know what your process is because you have some people who you know are absolutely committed to you know this idea the professional writer you kind of you get up at half eight you're at your desk at nine you work right through you have like a one hour lunch break you finish at six um, and you do that Monday to Friday and you're kind of you're very very disciplined and if that works for you that's absolutely fantastic but yet there's a whole other school of thought that says that why should you force yourself to be creative whenever you really really aren't feeling creative and actually by by you know by not doing anything for a week or two by thinking things through you'll have like you know an amazing productive like three day you know weekend where you'll write you know three thousand four thousand words so i don't think it's like um there's not one way to do it and i think that's what um emerges from the master classes where you have you have, you have writers turning up that would say that they don't have a process that they kind of really aren't sure what to do but then through listening to people, they actually realize that they, they do have a way that they do it or they cherry pick, you know, different ideas from different people. Um, so I, but, but I think the, the main thing to say is that if you don't feel like doing anything, because this is a very kind of precarious, anxious time, then that's absolutely fine. You know, don't beat yourself up about, about that. I think whenever we first went into lockdown, there was like a real, um, flurry of activity and like a real sense of people trying to fight against you know this sort of sense of inertia and kind of being you know trapped and locked in your house but i think the past you know now we're in like the third or fourth week of it i think i'm seeing a lot more people on social media talking about you know you know being open about you know, their mental health and about their anxiety and about the, the you know the feeling of exhaust exhaustion i mean certainly kind of i can relate as well you know suddenly you're having all this screen time where you know if you are working you're conducting everything you do with this with the screen you're either reading work or you're doing something like this which is which is zoom but then all, also all your leisure time is on screen as well so it's it, it um it can be really really overwhelming um so i think that's the you know that's the main thing to say is that if you're feeling creative that's fantastic but if you're not it's it's okay it's okay um i think you know, you're asking about like if you, you know tips or something for writing i think the number one way to to get inspiration is to kind of to read as much as possible if you're feeling that you can read and you want to read plays then then do that yeah no that's brilliant i mean the the interesting thing with quarantines and lockdowns is that the, you know everyone i think is uh, well a lot of people in the sector would have already seen you know the the idea that shakespeare wrote you know an absolute ton of his plays in quarantine for the plague yeah. you know yeah. it, it's interesting to think of you know Hamlet and, uh, and things coming out of a period of uh, of absolute quarantine. Um, I mean, yes, we should all be taking care of ourselves, uh, and I certainly hope that we, we all are, you know people are prioritising their their mental health and those who want to work. I mean, the idea that you know you could create the next Hamlet would be quite fun. Um, mm -hmm. what, what what you know is there anything you you would love to see coming out of it? The the quarantine kind of. You know any kind of types of work that, that would be you know be exciting to see you know as new writing is always kind of about what we're saying about what is happening right now you know when you know the entire world has just gone into a, an absolute shutdown is there anything that you would love any kind of voices to come through that you might love to hear um well i suppose like i am bracing myself like everyone else to get like a deluge of scripts about <laughs> self-isolation and quarantine yes. in about four to five months yeah and i'm not going to say i don't want to read them because it's always it's you know it's always to do with someone's individual voice or their perspective and you might have an absolutely incredible unique hot take on the situation so um you know if you want to write about that then then write about that but do so knowing there's going to be like a hell of a lot of 
competition for those sorts of those sorts of plays. Um, I mean, again, coming back to the idea that there's, you know, there was this whole, you know, rush to, to you know, to create content to kick back against, um, you know, isolation and stasis. I think, I think personally, my feeling is that we can need to be looking kind of longer term. So looking at supporting artists, not so much to be creating content, you know, you know, right now about now, but what what's I'm in, I'm really really interested in the work that's going to become you know produced in a year a year and a half from now which is going to be obviously developed during this time but is not going to necessarily speak rapidly mm. to this time yeah. I think whenever we come out of this situation we're not going to go back to normal there's going to be a shift and I'm really really interested in artists responses to that or imagining what that would be like um so I suppose it's um I suppose I really, really hope. Uh, we, we talked about it a little bit in terms of like you know, you know, artist support and governmental or kind of uh, an arts council responses to kind of that. So I really, really hope there's some clarity and some yeah proper support for artists. Well, we're take... we're recording this obviously before the arts yeah. council has announced it's yeah. it, it, the exact mechanism, but we might be broadcasting it just after they've well, hopefully just after they've maybe announced how people might apply. But yeah. certainly, it's a, it's a it's a great thought. Is you know. We, we are kind of, a lot of people are taking stock about how the sector is funded, how the sector is designed and how, um, how do we work together, you know, collectively for the better well-being. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, thinking long term is a lovely thing to do in this, in this, in this moment where we've actually got to take a breath to yeah. think about what systems are we going to put in place to not only just recover, but to recover well. Um, you know, is there anything uh, that you would love to, to, that you've been wanting to do for a while that you haven't had time because of the urgent pressure of always producing, always developing, always having something coming through? Is there something that you would love to, to recommend, even not just, just for you at the Lyric, because, uh, you know, the things that you would love to see other places that now we've got time to think about that we might be able to design? I mean, that's, that's, that's difficult to answer because I'm hoping in this time that we're going to be thinking about that. I think one of the things that um, it's really, really interesting, isn't it? Because we, we, we're all in the business of making live work. Um, the thing of, that works about theatre that we're so passionate about, that is so interesting, is that it's a live experience and it's the collective experience that we're all, exper you know, we're all there together. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a social activity. So that can't happen now. So it's interesting to me that, you know, theatre people, theatre makers are now in the business of creating kind of digital content, um, which is, uh, which is, has pros and cons to it. Let's, let's just say it's, um, uh, it's, it's interesting. And I suppose, yeah, it's like the, what was it with the, kind of the different the different method you know the methodology in terms of making work as well like the different approaches were you asking about or well or, so or, or if we've got the, time or to venues it, or organizations yeah you i know? mean you, you were just saying you, you wanted to see things you know when we come back out of it put better systems in place i'm just wondering you know what did you think anything you know of course yes those things are being developed now or being some people are thinking about them now but just is there anything that came to mind that you would love to see you know, in, a, in an ideal world, just you know, come into place. Do we do we need a system uh, in Northern Ireland that's um, uh, you know, like uh, like like uh, uh, Rough Magic have in this in the south with the Seeds program? You know, do we do we want to have? Uh, you know, what is the ideal that you would love to have come in place that would just um, that we just ha we haven't had time to put in place before, or just no one's been able to do it? That you would think now is the time to think about how should we actually do this? I mean like aside from a full-on socialist revolution which is what i actually want <laughs> which i think i mean which i mean like let's you know talk that big i think the you talk about the systems being in place for um for artists and for making work i think it's actually what's potentially up for grabs is something much bigger it's actually the systems of power the systems of of governance are actually up for grabs yeah um there's a lot at stake and i think um kind of one of the big things I suppose I'm looking at um, is just what this situation has done is just highlight the precariousness of you know freelancers and kind of zero hours contract. And I think um, something that we knew before this, this is really really thrown into relief, is that there really isn't adequate support. Mm. I think for 
for freelancers or that sense of security yeah. that sense of you know that um it's been shared loads and I'm, I'm totally stealing something from twitter and it's like a cliche but it's really really interesting in these times of difficulty that freelancers and people on kind of zero contracts are expected to have savings mm. but billionaires and massive corporations are expected to be bailed out um i think there's something really wrong with like there's something wrong with that yeah um so so yeah like you were talking about theater but i genuinely think there will be a shift coming out of this and i think it's people's opportunity to kind of really you know think about the systems of, of, of power which kind of permeate everything not just the arts but yeah certainly it's one of my biggest fears is well not my biggest fears maybe that's being slightly hyper uh, hyperbolic but um you know, I would love. I would certainly. I, I would agree with you on the socialist revolution. Um, but the, the certainly, it's a fear that we'll just go back to normal, um, right back to kind of exactly the neoliberal kind of nightmare that we've all been struggling through for a very long time, and mm. uh, or growing up in. I suppose it's it's you know we're we're uh, uh, you know grew, grew up in the eighties uh, under Thatcher, and um, you know that that kind of mindset has pervaded everything since. Uh, so it's it's hard to see how the world will change unless there was a massive catastrophe and I suppose a lot of people have been waiting for a massive catastrophe just not particularly this one um, to kind of show that you know that it is just a massive house of cards but it certainly would be lovely to you know is, is it things like universal basic income that you would love to see or w what kind of things would you if you, if you were uh, uh, prime minister on, on day one of the of the reformation um, what would you put in place like just don't give me power like, <laughs> that's the people who you want to give power to you want to give the power to the people who don't want power it's the people who have power and want power you have to stay away from them just turn into a despot but <laughs> you know, I, benevolent like, despot I, like i don't want to like i have i'm not gonna like put myself up as like an act like an economist or like you know someone who's like super like like a political analyst or whatever but yeah universal income looks pretty pretty good but it's but it's people always like use like norway and mm. um uh, like oman has universal income as well but like they are huge oil rich states yeah but like distribution of wealth just a little bit yeah. would be would, would be nice i think yeah it's just the fact that so many people have had work cancelled and they're already through like you know you know in week one we're thrown into you know really serious economic kind of dire straits yeah that, that isn't right that shouldn't be the way it is yeah i think one of the loveliest stories i i, uh, I read at the beginning was um people like um taxi drivers who were immediately they they didn't quite there was a couple of stories where people didn't realize just how close to the wire the entire country was mm -hmm. and they kind of you know the kind of people who would go oh you know don't like the the scrounging freelancers or don't like the scrounging such yeah. and such and then all of a sudden you know the uh, the bottom's fallen out of everywhere and you know there's a, a nice understanding of how difficult it is to be on the benefit system how difficult universal credit is uh, and uh, and so many other systems that are put in place to to st well they're meant to be put in place to protect us and to help us and it's just you know they haven't been like that for a very long time Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll bring it back a little bit to um, to uh, uh, oh, literary management. Yeah, Sorry? just back to back to theatre away from the revolution. <laughs> oh no, that will go, go full on revolution. No, um, but if, is there is there a favourite? Um, we're talking about dramaturgs fighting, uh, or I was. Um, uh, is there a favourite dramaturgy hero that you've got um, that you would love to um, pick their brain about anyone, anything, any any specific scripts or things like that? Oh well, here look because I. Uh, so the masterclasses that we run. So basically that's my opportunity to bring in, like invite in my dramaturgy heroes and meet them and just grill them under the auspices of, you know, <laughs> development. So I've had some really, really great people over and they're like, they're my peers and my colleagues and they're um, they're amazing. So we've had fantastic people over like um, Suzanne Bell, who works at Royal Exchange uh, in Manchester and also oversees the Bruntwood Prize. She's won the Kenneth Tynan Award. Um, she is superb, um, really fantastic. Like Southern colleagues like Louise Stevens at the Abbey and Pam McQueen, um, who works at New Theatre. Um, you just you just learn so much kind of um, from, from them and kind of conversations with them, how they approach work. We do Halloran over from the bush. Um, uh, yeah, last year, last summer. Um, Graham Wybrow, a legend, mm -hmm. uh, kind of worked the Royal Court and and, and the Lear. 
Um, so it's that <laughs> those are my opportunity to bring over people that I um, I'm really really interested in, and I uh, learn a lot from them. And it's also great because it puts it, it kind of puts for writers here, it kind of puts a face to the name, so that whenever they're approaching kind of theatres in you know the UK or Ireland, that they kind of maybe have a bit more confidence about doing yeah. about doing that because I think. Uh, well, some Northern Irish writers and some of them have kind of suggested this to me. They kind of feel a bit anxious about approaching kind of other theatres. Like, will they be interested in my work? Will they be interested in kind yeah. of a Northern Irish writer, Northern Irish work? Um, so, yeah, everyone we've brought over or up or, you know, down or around has been kind of really supportive of, of the writers and given yeah. a lot of their time. And, and also kind of beyond that, they have, they've done the masterclasses, but often they've stayed in touch and I can send them work and we'll have a conversation about kind of writers I'm working with. So um yeah it's it you know it's kind of the literary managers of uh that are currently working around the uk and ireland also they're mostly irish which is kind of um something i noticed like jill greer now in soho uh ellie white in in the trav as well as those i've mentioned before are all are all irish so <laughs> yeah it's it's one of those things that um i feel that Local artists, uh, when they're coming up, kind of feel, as you said, they can't they can't just email someone. Whereas the, a sim similar person in England, Scotland, they feel that there's I don't know whether it's the sea border or whatever it is or different mm -hmm. borders. We feel that we can't reach out in the same way. Um, and other you know cheeky little writers will will email uh, Graham Wybury and say, hey, look at this, please. Um, but we can. You know, mo most yeah. you know people in the in the sector are absolutely lovely uh, everywhere. And uh, we'll happily do a cup of tea and a chat, um, and it's well worth it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that, that, I mean that's the thing. It's like I, I, I mean, from my perspective, I will always look for an opportunity to have a cup of tea and a chat about writing because it gets mm. me away from like in front of a screen <laughs> and actually talking to a writer, which I would much rather prefer to do. Talk about their script. Yeah. Um, now, now your virtual cup of teas come with the screen, unfortunately. Uh, virtual afternoon tea, vir virtual coffee morning, um, and literally all literary managers that I, I know are, are exactly the same. They're really open to just dropping them an email. When are you free? Can mm -hmm. I have a chat to you about this? You know, it's like I kind of, that is, I suppose it's not just the accessibility, it's the confidence yeah. to, to, to send that first email or, or something, or to put yourself up for that award, like Papa Tango and um, Brontwood, you know, they receive thousands of scripts, you know, they'll, they'll give feedback. So why shouldn't you but can yeah. apply, you know, to those as well? Likewise, the the Jarwood bursary is a really good one that yeah. they've done a, a fantastic job of trying to get artists to come in and be invigilators as part of the actual um, assessment of it. And th those bursaries are now they're, they're actively trying to make sure that they're they're much more focused upon the nation as a whole. And you know, I I, I know quite a few writers who who even won't actually apply to the ACNI sign up because you know they just don't quite think about it of themselves as needing funding to do what mm -hmm. they do but it's there there are structures there to, to help that you know yeah. both national and local um, I think just to, 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 to wrap up um, you mentioned that if we if we have the energy uh, and the, the the drive to do some reading uh, you mentioned is one of the key things that you would suggest read 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 um, anything on the on the the preferred reading list that you might suggest for anyone? Um, <laughs> yes, right. This is like a merciless plug for, uh, I suppose, lyric shows. We've got we've got some play texts um, from shows that were performed kind of the past kind of couple of years. So, uh, like Far Below by Owen McCafferty, um, the alternative that was co-produced with um, Fish Amble by Michael Patrick and Oshin Kearney, mm -hmm. uh, All Mod Cons by Erica Murray, artist in residence last year. Um, and Crocodile Fever by Megan Tyler. So those are all um, available if you, if you know, from the lyric. If you kind of, if you want to contact um, us and, and order some of those, um, we can order yeah. it directly from the lyric as well, no? Yeah, yeah. You can. They're all. They're all there. there so if you want to, to just drop someone a line or, or drop me a line, um, I can kind of get books to you. Um, who else do I love? Fish Amble have a lot of texts. Mm. They have like an online store as well. Um, and the Royal Court as well. Like you know, basically all the you know the online uh, stores, the National Theatre as well. Yeah, Bush. That will deliver to you. I'm just trying to think who I really love. Um, I, Annie Baker. Mm. I'm just obsessed with her. I think she's fantastic. Um, I've just read. Um, Seven Methods of Killing Kylie Jenner. Um, 
which is amazing. It's Brilliant. by Jasmine Lee Jones, so I'd recommend that highly. And I've also, I've ordered, but no, I've got it here, but I haven't read A Very Expensive Poison by Lucy Preble. Oh, lovely. Lucy Preble, Love amazing. a bit of Lucy Preble. She, and it's just, it just won the um, Susan Smith Blackburn mm. prize. So, like, you know, it's good. Brilliant. And she wrote Succession as well, so. Um, just trying to think what else. Um, oh, he, Nick Hearn, the publisher, have like a uh, like a play reading group. So every week they will um, uh, let you download for free or read online for free, like a text. So I think this this last week was Yan. So you can kind of uh, can access it for free and then you can read it and then join like an online chat about it. That's or even if you want to read the play and not, and not chat about it to people on Twitter. <laughs> it's also fine. That's really, really good. So if you can check their Twitter, all the details are there for Brilliant. that. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. No pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on to this <laughs> chat show. Yeah, chat show. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, yeah, th please, please stay well, uh, as I'm hoping you will be, uh, and, uh, and to others. So uh, yeah, thank you. Great. Thank you. Stay safe and stay well. <laughs>